Okay, welcome back after our short break. Uh, we will now move with the first panel session. Uh, my colleague uh, Silvia Barova from ASMA will uh, guide us through this panel session. Silvia, please, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Maya, and I'm very happy to welcome everyone um, in this first panel session. We have a very busy agenda ahead of us, but very, very interesting. And I hope I will manage to guide you uh, through without uh, much of a delay, and then uh, we can have a possibility for a lot of uh, uh, questions and interactions uh, with, the, with the audience and our great uh, speakers. My name is um, Silvia Barova, I'm working with the LIFE and Nature team. Uh, in uh, EASME, which is the agency uh, hosting the uh, LIFE uh, program. Uh, as uh, already was introduced in the um, uh, previous uh, session, we will use our, uh, the great tool of Slido um, to um, interact uh, with, the, uh, with the speakers. Uh, so that I invite you all, uh, if you're not uh, connected to Slido, please uh, write in your browser slido.com and then use the hashtag life for nature to um, uh, connect to our um, Slido space and post all your questions there. I invite everyone um, to use only Slido for, for questions and not the chat because it will be very difficult to follow um, both of them. Although we have a great team of uh, colleagues uh, working in the back office and they follow everything. Um, so the first uh, panel session uh, we will have four uh, speakers that will present four different public fund, funds, basically European funds, and the possibilities of financing uh, connectivity, conservation, uh, and ecological uh, corridors, being uh, protection, being um, identification um, of those, uh, and uh, being uh, management. Um, and uh, after the uh, four speakers, we will have two uh, panelists, which are practitioners that uh, used so far uh, some of these uh, funding possibilities to tell us their, uh, briefly their experience, and they will have the possibility to ask uh, um, uh, uh, questions uh, to the speakers. And then we'll have a questions and answer uh, session where um, uh, um, we'll go through the questions that are introduced in Slido. I will try to take them um, in order among uh, their popularity. So please ask your questions and vote uh, for the questions uh, that you would like to be um, asked. And uh, um, I hope uh, uh, this, uh, that we'll have a great uh, experience uh, in this first uh, panel session. Without any further ado, and in the interest of the time, I would like to invite our first um, uh, speaker, my colleague Silvia Donato, who will present us uh, the possibilities uh, possibilities that are provided by the LIFE uh, program. So, um, Silvia, the floor is yours. Thank you very much and uh, good morning uh, to everybody. Um, I've been asked, in fact, to illustrate a bit what uh, LIFE can do to support uh, connectivity. And to do so, uh, I will start by giving uh, just uh, uh, some few information about what has been done so far. Um, so, if I can have the first slide, please. Um, since the time is short, I won't be able to go into details of all projects uh, uh, that have been financed in the long uh, time of the uh, existence of the LIFE program. However, I would like to point out to you two publications that can provide um, this type of information. And one is a fact sheet uh, that has been produced in occasion of this event and that um, summarizes some of the main uh, achievement of LIFE program on connectivity and provides also some uh, uh, examples, concrete examples of projects financed in this area. Uh, a second uh, relevant publication is a report entitled Bringing Nature Back Through Life um, that uh, includes uh, a number of uh, uh, concrete cases uh, at impact, uh, an assessment of the impact that life has done in a number of nature biodiversity areas, including uh, on uh, connectivity. Uh, however, I would like still to give you uh, some elements and I would start maybe with some uh, figures um, through, uh, that, uh, with the charts that you see in these slides. 
that summarize the findings of uh, an analysis that we carried out uh, over just uh, a small sample of uh, life projects. So this is not, uh, um, uh, let's say, the, the full picture, uh, which is uh, very difficult to capture when we mm -hmm. talk about connectivity. Uh, and it shows uh, uh, how connectivity has been addressed in terms of habitats and in terms of uh, uh, species. The large majority of projects that we uh, sampled uh, were addressing uh, connectivity in terms of habitats habitats and uh, the three uh, main ecosystems types that have been uh, uh, targeted through life funding uh, are uh, uh, in fact rivers, uh, grasslands and forests. Uh, when it comes to uh, species, uh, almost half uh, of the funding has gone uh, to birds and invertebrates, uh, followed by small mammals uh, and large carnivores. So this is uh, in terms of, let's say, uh, quick uh, figures about the life program, but in terms of action, if I can have the next slide, please. Um, a lot of the support uh, uh, that the life has provided uh, has been centered uh, on Natura 2000 and connectivity in support of the network. This is not surprising because we can say that Natura 2000 is really the heart of biodiversity in Europe. Uh, and it also um, matches what was presented this morning uh, in the sense that life is a tool that has been also um, designed to uh, support uh, uh, po EU policy legislation and in the field of nature and biodiversity, Natura 2000 really rep represent uh, a key cornerstone. Uh, in terms of connectivity, one of the key challenges that have been uh, addressed is in fact fragmentation. Uh, often caused by uh, pressures such as uh, urbanization, agriculture, linear infrastructure such as roads uh, uh, or uh, um, power lines. And the life projects have provided uh, in these years uh, a number of uh, uh, solutions, um, for instance, uh, uh, creating ecological corridors, removing uh, uh, barriers uh, that helped also, for instance, restoring rivers to a free flowing state uh, and also protecting uh, uh, in general land uh, and seas, uh, as well as building, as we just saw an example, green infrastructure through various elements uh, that you see like uh, uh, in this uh, infographic uh, at the very uh, bottom uh, in small designs. Uh, but all this is to just give you an idea of uh, what has been done so far and that can be the basis also uh, for the contribution to the uh, EU biodiversity strategy for 2030. And that's I already now project a bit more into the future. Uh, if I can have the next slide, please. Uh, I will uh, uh, just uh, give you some few uh, information about uh, the new the new program uh, that, as you may know, has increased this budget to uh, five four point billion euros uh, during the whole uh, programming period. Uh, life still remains the uh, only EU program that is exclusively dedicated to environment, uh, nature conservation and climate action. Uh, there's a novelty when it comes to its uh, sub-programs uh, that have become four with the addition of a new one related to clean energy uh, transition. Uh, and uh, uh, an important aspect of uh, the LIFE program for the next uh, period is, of course, that it will fully uh, uh, support uh, the implementation of the EU Green Deal. Uh, as I talk about this, uh, uh, you uh, may know uh, that recently the Commission also decided to uh, establish uh, a new agency that will be uh, dedicated to the support of the EU Green Deal. Uh, and its name will, is uh, European Climate Infrastructure and Environment e Executive Agency. Um, next slide, please. Uh, so. Uh, how connectivity uh, can be still addressed uh, in the future. Uh, I think uh, a lot will be similar to what has happened uh, already in the past mm -hmm. uh, with a, a um, clear entry point when it comes to the sub-program on nature biodiversity mm -hmm. and this uh, uh, building on the existing uh, policy and uh, legislation uh, starting uh, with the Habitat Spurs Directive and therefore the support, uh, strong support to Natura 2000 network, but also uh, invasive alien species regulation, pollinator strategies, and of course the new biodiversity strategy for uh, 2030. Uh, still, uh, there will be, uh, or even though maybe in an indirect way, opportunities uh, under uh, the sub-programs uh, uh, dedicated to circular economy and quality of life, as well as climate mitigation and adaptation through different measures 
such as um, green infrastructure, nature-based solutions, action targeting water uh, or forest. This is just to give in broad terms uh, some, some examples. Um, a lot of the work for the definition of the program, uh, therefore the next uh, life regulation, the multi-annual board program, and the definition of funding opportunities are still uh, being finalized. So um, this work is still ongoing, uh, but, and, and therefore also uh, at the moment we, there are not specific information about the next call, but this will be uh, for sure published in the next uh, months and the information as soon as possible will be uh, made available on the LIFE website where uh, all the information about all the novelties of the program will be uh, publicly available. And I think with this uh, I conclude so this introduction to the LIFE program support to connectivity. Thank you very much um, Silvia for this brief but, but very informative uh, presentation. Um, I would again welcome the audience. If you have questions, please don't hesitate to post them in Slido. And, uh, and there is a lot of questions um, from the previous um, uh, session uh, that uh, um, I believe if you don't find the answer during the presentation that we have a lot of questions that were addressing to the EU funding opportunities, please don't hesitate to ask them um, again. Um, I forgot to mention that um, uh, for the audience uh, that uh, our session is uh, recorded and then all the presentations and all the sessions will be made available on the live uh, website uh, later on. So don't be busy to uh, note from the slides uh, that you see on the screen. Uh, without any further ado, I would like to invite uh, my colleague Nerea Aispurua from um, the directorate uh, from the General Directorate of uh, Research and Innovation, who will provide, um, provide us with information about the possibilities for financing um, uh, connectivity uh, uh, conservation and that um, uh, um, and, uh, uh, research that Horizon uh, Europe uh, will uh, provide. So Nerea, the floor is yours. Hi, hello, good morning everyone. As a, well, I'm part of the biodiversity team working in DGE research and innovation, and I hope that I could bring some good news for you. So let's start um, next, please. So the first thing that I would like to highlight is that Horizon 2020, that is the current uh, framework program for research and innovation, has, uh, let's say, has invested a uh, vast amount of money on, on biodiversity. We have been focusing, in, especially in the last calls, on nature-based solutions and in more than 70 cities and with demonstration projects. So it's not a research and innovation, but, but also we have been working with a, with a pilot and test component. And we hope that in the next framework program, we continue with this. And just to highlight that the, the latest call that we have, uh, that it was the EU Green Deal call uh, with 1 billion had a 80 million call on restoration. Right now there is under evaluation 71 proposals. So we expect that uh, these proposals will bring a lot of, let's say, concept on uh, that could help on, on, on restoration and to, to the connectivity. Uh, but now I would like to introduce to the new EU framework program that is Horizon Europe. So whatever I say, just uh, keep in mind that it's on draft. So I will talk about the things that uh, we are proposing that is not 100% sure that they will stay there. So I keep the good intentions that we have so, uh, so you will listen about that. So um, I will talk Horizon Europe. Uh, we'll keep the same structure that has uh, Horizon 2020, and I will be more focused on the areas that are uh, called societal challenge. And in this case, uh, within the societal challenge, uh, there is one specific cluster that will address, uh, let's say, environment and natural resources. So I will be focused in this part that is the, the one that I'm more familiar. So in this, uh, in this whole cluster six, we are, uh, have like five uh, sub areas. One of them will be direct to understand, which is the understanding the, the biodiversity decline. Uh, then we will focus on valuing and restoring biodiversity and ecosystem services. 
Uh, also, we are trying to understand how to manage uh, biodiversity in the primary production, but also tackling uh, like indirect drive of biodiversity loss uh, with the transformative change. Um, then interconnecting biodiversity research and supporting policies. And I will explain what that means because we are putting in place a new biodiversity partnership. I will try to explain more. But I would like to, uh, to focus more specifically on the on, on, on this new, I would like to highlight that with, with this new part, we, re, we are really supporting the new EU biodiversity strategy. We will be trying to help monitoring all the targets, including uh, the build of, of, of a coherent uh, trans-European network that it will include the, the corridor. So to restore the integrity of the terrestrial, aquatic and marine ecosystem. That, and, and also we are developing a long-term biodiversity research agenda that we include and we will try to capture all the knowledge gaps and needs to be covered in the next seven years. But just to be more focused and more concrete, I will explain uh, what is the intended to cover. So for sure, we will have a specific funding, let's hope for the setup of ecological corridor. We expect to capitalize on all the work that has been done by other, by other EU funded projects. Um, the idea is also to, 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 to focus on innovation solutions that could be replicable uh, in terms of financing and in other aspects. Uh, and also it, it will, it, it, it's meant to support the national authorities to collaborate with, with other ongoing initiatives. So this is the, the main intention. So this is will be one focus areas, but also we are uh, working on supporting the current knowledge gap to better understanding the condition of the ecosystem and their services in Europe uh, in, in, in relation with the conditions. So when to define when the, the ecosystem are in good condition or not. So it, 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 with the new biodiversity strategy, they will be trying to do a framework to do so. We will focus also specifically in, in coastal and marine biodiversity, ecosystem services, spatial planning, event, identification of my uh, protected areas, marine protected areas. We will keep it focusing on, on nature-based solutions. Um, uh, we will try to, we are going to put in place what, is, what has been announced by the biodiversity strategy, that is the so-called science service. Uh, this is, uh, will be implemented in the, in, in, in the first world program. Um, it's aimed to the biodiversity research is, in, is connected across Europe, supporting national, European and environmental policies and, and, and also international conventions. And we expect the science serving to be a single entry point a link in the European research and biodiversity policy making, and this will be embedded in the in the knowledge center of biodiversity and ecosystem services that I think that was uh, introduced by by the GRC colleagues last last week. Uh, also, we will support uh, as we are doing now, and it's important. I think the mainstream of natural capital accounting. So, how we are going to measure these ecosystem services? So, we have already in Europe some initiative that is called the Keep Inca that is trying to measuring these ecosystem services and, and, and to, to using a specific uh, international uh, system of accounting. So, we are going to focus on that uh, to give you instruments to, to, to support this. Um, more or less. So this is one of our, so I, as I said, I was focusing in this uh, so-called cluster uh, six, but in Horizon Europe, there is another cluster working on climate that also will help to understand the interaction between climate change and ecosystem and how the ecosystem are impacted by climate change. So how the animals are going to need to move. So this also can be framed in these other, in these other areas. Um, so I have talked uh, one part of Horizon Europe, but Horizon Europe have also in place a new instrument that are the European Partnership. The European Partnership are co-funded uh, actions between member states and, and, the, and the European Commission. And we have put a, a next slide, please. Ah, okay, yes. I, I missed one thing, the mission, but I can came back also, sorry. Um, so, uh, the European partnership, as I said, uh, this one that is already in place and the, the strategic research agenda has been published in public consultation, uh, will have 
uh, for working areas. One of the working areas will be focused on the knowledge and data needed for to understand which is the biodiversity status, and this will be developed uh, will be developed like joint calls where the member states will decide what is need or not. It will have also a, a second. Um, a second part in this working area that is uh, related to monitoring. Uh, it's a big component that will try to harmonize the data, the methodology, will test new methods uh, to do monitoring, new technologies, um, uh, involve the citizens. So it will be an investment of more than 100 million on monitoring. So this is a, a really big component. Uh, the third working area will be to connecting the research and innovation programs. A resource so is a more uh, science policy interface, how the results of the project will support the policy. So this is also relevant. And, and finally, uh, we will support the, the international. At the same time, it will have some overarching objective but just to just to highlight that this is the first time that in a partnership we have a research agency plus environmental minister together working working for the same for the same aim to mention that so far we have 63 partners committed in these partnerships and um, still we have some some pending partners to, to be confirmed. So we hope that these partnerships so be aware that this is happening now. Uh, we expect that the whole Horizon Europe will be adopted in mid-May and the partnership is uh, possibly open the calls in, 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 in September and October. So, so this is one of the big things. And also in the, as was in the previous slide, Another opportunity coming in Horizon Europe is the so-called missions. So the missions are instruments that try to, to provide clear direction and targeted uh, objective. They are uh, looking for solutions that can be understandable for the citizen. And this also, this uh, project will be experimented in the regions. So it's, it's, it's it will, it will bring uh, a portfolio of actions that will include research projects, policy measures, even a legislative initiative to, to achieve uh, the goals. So we have uh, five missions and the mission that I think that could be more relevant for, for, for the corridors could be the adaptation to climate change including societal transformation. So I'm sure that they are developing, a, they are putting in place a, let's say, part that could, could help to support these, 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 these corridors. Um, next one, please. Nerea, I would like to ask you to be brief. Well, this is just the end. So I have put in here the link where you will be able to find all the funding and tender opportunities and also the knowledge center that we hope that also helps you to find all these research uh, opportunities and consider that we, this will be the center of all what will happen on biodiversity. So sorry, thank you very much. Thank you very much for this very, very um, interesting and uh, very comprehensive um, uh, presentation that uh, Horizon Europe, uh, uh, the, the possibilities that Horizon Europe will, will provide. Um, I'm sure that there will be a lot of um, questions um, on that as well. So please, uh, the audience, don't hesitate to ask questions. If our speakers uh, didn't manage to explain uh, what you're interested in and provide enough uh, information. Uh, and uh, I would like to um, invite uh, our next speaker, uh, my colleague Antonia Rutekin from Directorate General from Agriculture, uh, who is going to uh, present us what are the funding opportunities within, uh, within the upcoming reform of the Common Agricultural Policy uh, to support the connectivity um, conservation in the agricultural uh, context. Uh, there was a lot of uh, questions in the previous session about the possibilities under the um, common agricultural policies. So um, I'm sure that uh, this um, presentation will be um, um, answering to many of the questions, but if you still have questions, uh, please don't hesitate to introduce them in uh, Slido. Uh, uh, Antonia, the floor is yours. Yeah, thank you very much, Sylvia, uh, and thank you for inviting me to this uh, to this very interesting event. Indeed, uh, my name is Antonia Lutiken. I'm working in DG Agri uh, and 
in the unit conception for rural development. I will have the big uh, challenge to get to run you through. And now I have to see how, why it doesn't, yeah, no, sorry, and the next slide doesn't, that doesn't work. Uh, to, uh, to run you quickly through the reform of the CAP, which is currently under this discussion, as you may have, uh, well, as you all are well aware, because uh, you are very much linked to also the agriculture sector. And I will, of course, focus on, on the parts which are interesting for us. And that starts uh, here with the nine specific objectives that we have in the CAP, for which the object objective nine to contribute to the uh, to the biodiversity and hence the ecosystem services and habitats and landscapes the so-called uh, specific object objective six is uh, the most important ones but uh, as you can see here it's one out of nine um, what we have in the new CAP is the new green architecture, which is really built in, and I think this picture very much illustrates that, is, is uh, built up from different building blocks. It has um, uh, enhanced conditionality. I will come back to those elements later on. It has then the, the so-called pillar one, the direct payments with the, the eco schemes, which have already been uh, mentioned also by my colleague uh, beforehand, and uh, the classical rural development measures, which we know already now, uh, which I have not only the agri-environmental measures, but also so knowledge transfer, uh, innovation, cooperation, etc. Um, this time in the new green architecture the, for the next uh, years to come, the member states will set up plans using both pillars together in one plan. So that already will be a big change because uh, the, all the parts of the agricultural policy will be in one plan based on one SWOT analysis and based, based on a needs assessment um, with the possibility of the selection of tools from a flexible toolbox and uh, with the need to set targets and uh, the achievements being monitored. Um, very important in this uh, context is that the consultation with national stakeholders is really um, something that uh, we very much focus on. We have done that already in the past for the part on rural development, but uh, that was not as much fixed in the regulation for the first pillar. So this time, as it is all in one plan, this is really a chance also to have a say on, on, the, on, on the first pillar on direct payments. And I've seen one uh, question already going in that direction. Uh, the plans are then approved by the commission as uh, the usual procedures. What is in the nutshell important aspects for nature and biodiversity? First of all, there is of course the, the no backsliding principle. We have in the second pillar in rural development already the 30% per member states to be devoted for environment and climate purposes. And this is also to take one question up from, from, from Slido. These percentages and these what we call ring fencing is always figures per member state. So it's not that one member state can, can be happy that uh, the other one is doing more, uh, but these figures are clearly per member state, per plan. And this is maybe one, one also one thing that uh, I, I made, made not clear enough. Uh, in the current situation, in the current programming period we have for rural development, we have in, in some member states the regionalized plans. So in the case of Spain, where we had the project before, we had regionalized uh, rural development programs. Now this time we will have one cap plan per member state. That is indeed for some member states which, re which are very big and which have uh, regionalized structures a little challenging, but it allows also to have uh, more synergies and to have, uh, to have simpler project uh, plans. This is at least what we hope. There is in the CAP in the future a list of legislations concerned by uh, of the CAP uh, plan regulations. So this list uh, is listening environmental and, uh, and climate regulations to which the CAP plans should contrib contribute. So there is a far bigger link 
between the CAP and the other environmental and climate legislation. And uh, there are 12 items listed. And of course, the Birds and Habitats Directive pr plays a very prominent role in that. So there is a clear link of the future CAP to the Birds and Habitats Directive and to the, to the ambition to, to serve also the Birds and Habitats Directives more than it was in the past uh, with this new CAP plan. Um, the CAP plan by, by this also needs to take into account the analysis and the objectives and targets for Habitats and Birds Directive and which includes the PAFs. I will not go too far more into detail of that, but we, uh, as we have seen that already. And they are also include, uh, there is also an article which allows or which uh, provides uh, the possibility to include the strategic nature projects under the life uh, uh, regulations uh, to be included and to be supported by, by the CAP plans. So, and uh, they, by these, they can be upscaled and uh, member states can propose nature protective, uh, strategic nature projects and fund it with some of the ERFRD money. So some of the money for rural development, like cooperation, like agri-environmental in interventions, uh, like management commitments, etc. So also there, there is a closer link than before. And as I said before, the competent authorities for environment and climate are to be effectively involved in the CAP plan uh, setting. So this is really the call to, to all of you and uh, to, to pass to, to your authorities for environment and climate the active role you want to play in the CAP and they have to play in the, in the CAP plan setting. Um, there are some examples I want to uh, quickly run through uh, of the green architecture and landscape for landscape and biodiversity, which can design to focus on several elements beneficial for the environment, which can promote the protection of existing elements, but also increase the presence of elements provide also measures to prevent damages for, uh, for example, for, um, from protected species like the wolf and the bears, etc. Um, I will not go into detail. This is then these kind of building blocks. We have the conditionality in, in the front line. So the, what we call the baseline on the bottom, what is known very much as cross compliance in the, in, in the current pro uh, programming period, which uh, defines good agricultural and environmental conditions at member state level, but which has also the so-called SMRs, the statutory mandatory requirements. These are all the baselines that members, that farmers have in any how in any way to comply with. And then we have the eco schemes where we have different eco schemes at different level. There is no time to go into detail uh, what we can have here. And then we will have uh, also in, in the rural development different possibilities to block that in a way that serves both uh, biodiversity and landscape. The same for Natura 2000. Um, which aims at contributing to reach a conservation status and preser for preserving or restoring habitat associated with agriculture. And here we have a specific indicator also in the future to show what we are not, where we are not only paying for, for the um, legal requirements which are valid and, and applicable in Natura 2000, but where we also do more to improve those Natura 2000 areas. And I think also that one is very important. Uh, here again, it can be a combination. It will be a combination of uh, the relevant conditions for, for conditionality. So for example, the, the what we call the GAIC 10, the ban on converting or plowing permanent grassland in Natura 2000 sites and, and or other elements and we have again the member states can design different which can have and which hopefully will have a, a very broad coverage and uh, also then um, combining that with investments for restoration of Natura 2000 or with uh, payments for Natura 2000 uh, agricultural and forest land and uh, also for management commitments going beyond. 
Um, yeah, I would yes, you. this is uh, then the, the, the links. I think they are also put in the chat. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, um, Antonia, for these um, very informative um, uh, presentations. Uh, presentation. Um, I would like now to invite uh, our last speaker for this uh, panel session, uh, Maud uh, Skardingen from um, Director General for Regional Development, uh, who will present us what are the funding opportunities under the European Regional uh, Development uh, Fund and especially the Interreg um, program. And so more to the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you very much uh, for inviting me. I, I will also try to take you through quite a lot of information in a couple of minutes, but uh, don't worry. I mean, you will get the slides afterwards as has been mentioned, so you can take a closer look. But if we go to the first slide, so I am, uh, yeah, the next slide. I am going to talk about uh, the EU uh, cohesion policy in the next, in the upcoming uh, period. Uh, this is an important share of the EU budget, uh, around one third, and uh, we are talking about uh, four funds here. You see them here, the European Regional Development Fund, the, the Social Fund plus the Cohesion Fund and the new Just Transition Fund. Uh, with the overall aims, let's say, to reduce disparities between Europe's regions and to strengthen economic, social and territorial cohesion and contribute to EU priorities. Uh, so importantly, of course, the, the European uh, Green Deal. Uh, and uh, the bulk of the funding is concentrated uh, on the less developed uh, regions. This is still a preliminary map. Uh, that, that is here, but it's just to show you a bit uh, uh, where, where the main parts of the funding are going to the darker areas. And, and this funding is uh, happening uh, in what we call shared management uh, with the member states. So we have a, a set of national and regional programs uh, managed in the member states, uh, and I will explain a little bit uh, more later. And uh, they are, this funding is working on five different uh, policy objectives. You see them here, it's, it's, a, it's a wide uh, range uh, of different type, uh, types of uh, actions, let's say, and, and we will focus uh, here now on, on number two, uh, the, a green or a low carbon uh, um, transitioning towards a net zero carbon economy and resilient uh, Europe, a nice uh, long name here. Uh, but it's also, as you see, focus on non-research, innovation, SMEs, uh, transport, uh, employment, social issues, etc. And for Interreg specifically, there are also objectives related to, to better cooperation, governance and a safer and more secure Europe. Um, so, so the way that, it, that it's, the policy is working so broadly makes it, of course, uh, an, an integrated uh, and holistic uh, policy, let's say, which, which can be important for many of the, the European Green Deal uh, objectives. Uh, and we expect a formal adoption of the regulatory framework uh, in a couple of uh, months, uh, So, but the preparations are, are ongoing for the next period. Uh, the next slide, please, uh, will uh, uh, show a little bit more. So, so we have two goals, let's say, of the policy investment for jobs and growth with all the four funds and the European Territorial Cooperation, which is more known as Interreg, which is the European Regional Development Fund uh, uh, support. And uh, just to mention first that the bulk of the funding uh, is to the first uh, investment for jobs and growth, uh, uh, where, there, where there is also a link to, to the prioritized action framework uh, that has been uh, presented earlier this morning in the form of a kind of conditionality or an enabling condition, as we call it. Uh, uh, and also under these uh, investment for jobs and growth, uh, national and regional programs where you have uh, most uh, of the, the funding, let's say, that you should know that there are also increased opportunities uh, for cooperation in the, in the new period, from also from these national and regional programs. But I will focus now uh, uh, on the interreg part, uh, which is really specifically uh, a cooperation uh, framework, let's say. So, so for uh, cooperation between national, regional, local actors from different member states and also uh, third countries. 
and we are working with programs at uh, different geographical levels. So we have uh, a strand for cross-border cooperation. So, so you have a cooperation between adjacent uh, board regions really directly on the border uh, from different member states uh, or also at external borders. Uh, we have a transnational strand where you have uh, a larger geographic area, uh, which is more suited, suited for certain types of uh, cooperation and investments. And then a strand for a cooperation between regions from, from any member states, basically. Uh, you, you might uh, have heard about these programs as well, for example, Interreg Europe. And then a new strand for outermost regions. And uh, for all uh, this, in the next period, we have just about 8 uh, billion Euro. So it is a, an important financial support mechanism for cooperation across borders, and, and this includes, as we will see, can include the protection and preservation of nature and biodiversity. Uh, so the next uh, slide, please. Uh, we will look in some more detail at this policy objective uh, two that I mentioned. With the here, you have the complete uh, uh, title. Uh, and as I said, don't worry too much, try, don't try to read uh, everything now, you can take a look in peace and calm, but just to say that this uh, selection of this policy objective is compulsory for, for interreg uh, strands A, B and D programs. Uh, uh, but uh, then of course you have a menu here as you see of different specific objectives uh, and uh, the one which is most relevant for, for the topic of this event is uh, number seven, to, to enhance protection and preservation of nature, biodiversity and green infrastructure, uh, including in urban areas and reducing all forms of pollution. Again, some other specific objectives can be also uh, have, a, have some aspects which are relevant for, for connectivity, but we will focus uh, on this uh, number seven here. Uh, but uh, just be aware that uh, the pro even if this whole policy objective two is compulsory for these interreg programs, not every program will select each and every specific objective. So it will it will be a bit uh, different. It will look different in different uh, programs. Let's say where the emphasis uh, is, and this will be focused. This will be sorry build on uh, thorough analysis and and the the, the cross border areas or the transnational areas. So they will look at the needs uh, and potentials of that specific areas. Uh, on the next slide, please, we will look in some more detail on this uh, specific objective. Uh, and as you see, it can include, uh, uh, for example, then protection and preservation of nature and biodiversity, ecosystem restoration, green infrastructure, and, uh, but also other things which are, uh, let's say, less relevant to today's uh, topic. Uh, and uh, you see some points where we think there could be added value of the cross-border cooperation type of cooperation to, to, uh, to work on joint uh, knowledge development and planning, uh, joint protection of cross-border ecosystem, uh, ecosystems or joint management of natural sites. And then also EU level green infrastructure. And here we come for, for, for example, then to, to ecological corridors when they, come, when they go across borders. And a bit similar for transnational cooperation, but in, in, in a larger geographical scale. And here you also then can, can imagine support for ecological corridors across uh, several borders. Uh, and you see here also a quote from the biodiversity strategy, which is, uh, which is also stressing uh, the role uh, of, uh, of uh, European territorial uh, cooperation or, or interreg in this particular uh, context. Um, and we will also, talking about the added value of transnational cooperation, we will hear a bit later an example uh, of such cooperation in the Alpine region, which is taking place under a macro-regional strategy for that area. So, so that will give you some, some a bit more concrete example. Uh, the next slide, please, uh, to show you a bit uh, what is uh, happening now in terms of programs and, and some, some important points on projects. Uh, uh, so as I said, the preparation is currently ongoing, even if the regulatory framework is not formally adopted. And what is important to stress here is the, that we emphasize very much partnership uh, principle. Uh, and and uh, I think it links a bit 
also, I mean, we heard in the poll in the first day plenary session on cross-border challenges, etc. I think on top came the point to have both landowners and all kinds of stakeholders uh, involved. It's, it's very important, of course, uh, in this area. And uh, we are really wanting in the whole uh, programming and implementation to have all uh, concerned or affected uh, involved in various ways. Uh, many different partners, so it's just an invitation also to many of you, I think, who are active in this area to see in your specific uh, geographical area uh, what is going on in terms of uh, public consultations, etc., to, 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 to collect uh, input for the new set of programmes. And then we will have uh, programming negotiations, uh, let's say about, uh, we, will, we will get proposals uh, from the programme authorities and we will uh, discuss on programme ob objectives, types of actions and financial allocation, etc. And then ultimately uh, the, it's the Commission then which will uh, adopt the programmes. Uh, and uh, for the projects themselves, uh, they, they will need, of course, to involve a part, at least two partners from, from, two, di from two different uh, countries. Uh, and they need to fit in with the thematic scope uh, of the program, which will then look a, a bit different, as I have explained. And of course, contribute to the results uh, that the program is seeking to achieve. It's usually relatively small projects compared, compared to what we see under the, the national or regional, what we call mainstream uh, ERDF uh, program, um, projects. Uh, and uh, we are keen to also focus on new solutions, uh, etc. cetera. And, and just note also that many rules are program specific, uh, including some eligibility rules. And it's the, the managing authorities in the regions which manage the programs, launch calls, etc. And, and it's the pro each, each program has a monitoring committee who decides uh, on the funding. And I, as you all know, I think since, since you have already worked uh, in, in live projects, etc., it's, it's a bit of extra effort uh, probably in, in, in a lot of cooperation uh, projects. Uh, and uh, what is important here as well, of course, is that you can have, we are really striving for synergies and complementarities between all these different types of EU funding. So uh, with the interreg funding, uh, with, with, uh, with life, uh, with Horizon, etc. So, so uh, it can, uh, it project, uh, new projects can, for example, build on results uh, of earlier life projects or a Horizon project, etc. So to, to, to really try to use the knowledge which is uh, created. Uh, and then um, finally, to, find, yeah, to, final, to mention that the implementation of the, 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 the old programs is still ongoing. And in the final slide, you have uh, the next slide, the final one, you have some links uh, to more information and including to some data to see a bit uh, where support has been given in, in the, the previous period. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Maud, for your um, presentation. Um, we are um, late with the time uh, because we have a very charged, very interesting, very charged agenda today. And now it's the time for our um, actually two uh, panelists that we uh, have here uh, with us, uh, which will uh, very um, briefly inform us about their particular experience with some of these um, uh, funds. Uh, and uh, also have the opportunity to ask a question uh, if they have such uh, to the uh, to our uh, great speakers. For the audience uh, out there, please don't hesitate to uh, use uh, Slido. Um, so connect to slido.com, use the hashtag uh, life for nature and ask your questions to our um, uh, speakers. So without any uh, further ado, uh, Jürgen uh, Birtstorp from the da uh, Danish Nature Agency, um, uh, who is uh, working uh, under a LIFE uh, Naturman, which is a LIFE integrated project, will tell us um, a bit about uh, what they do with the agricultural um, uh, stakeholders communities and uh, trying to uh, propose or develop with them a different uh, uh, um, uh, nature uh, conservation um, to make the nature conservation uh, financially interesting uh, for them. So, uh, Jürgen, uh, please, um, the floor is yours. Be brief and ask your question. Yes, thank you very much. Can you hear me? Yes. 
Yes. Okay. I'm a project manager of this uh, Danish integrated life nature project, Nature Man. It covers 11 Natura 2000 sites in, in Denmark. Uh, the Natura 2000 sites in Denmark consist of a patchwork of agricultural areas and areas with protected habitat types. So the overall objective of Nature Man is to increase the biodiversity of the protected nature types, enlarge the areas and uh, increase, uh, improve the connectivities between the areas within the 2000 sites. So in short, we want to convert some agricultural areas into new nature or semi-natural areas in a buffer zone around the protected nature types or in corridors between them. It's an eight year project and we have a budget of 17.5 million euros. And in, the, in addition to that, we, uh, we want in the project to facilitate the coordinated use of 9.4 million euros in complementary fundings, mainly from the rural development program. The issue that I would like to address uh, is that NatureMan is an integrated project. In the project, we want to, to harvest the synergy between the Habitats Directive, the Water Framework Directive, the National Danish Climate Strategy, Rural Development, Region Development, and of course the future use of the areas, areas for agriculture and recreation. Uh, and uh, But we experience an in insufficient support from the Rural Development Programme to this uh, integrated approach. Uh, at least in the Danish implementation of the Rural Development Programme, payment is granted to the most cost-effective measures addressing only one issue. For example, we can get grant for a wetland project that is cost-effective in nitrogen removal, or a wetland that is cost-effective in phosphor removal, or a wetland that is cost-effective in carbon sequestration. But we can't get grants for an integrated project that removes some nitrogen, some phosphorus, uh, and at the same time improve biodiversity and nature value and help implementing the Water Framework Directive. Uh, integrated projects are almost by nature suboptimal project if you are looking at only one issue. Of course, projects must be cost effective, but in my point of view at least, the integrated approach is indeed a cost-effective approach. So my question is uh, mainly to uh, Antoni Lutzken from GG Agri. Um, do, do you agree that it's important that the, the national or regional authorities when implementing the rural development plan or more generally the CAP are encouraged to develop this integrated approach? Uh, and secondary, when you're examining the upcoming CAP national strategic plan, is that something that you will uh, put more emphasis on this integrated approach? Thank you very much, uh, Jorgen. Antonio? Uh, thank you, Jorgen, for, for, for this question. And I think it's, it's a really good question because it shows at, uh, at several aspects or several dimensions how complex it is to set the CAP plans. Uh, and, and here, of course, well, my first and easiest reply would be it's up to the member states to design these measures. And of course, uh, you know that. And of course, then you say, OK, but, but our does, member state doesn't do so. Uh, here I come back, of course, to, to the question that uh, they should be very, uh, so the nature uh, protection stakeholders in that respect should be very much involved in, in, in this issue. Now, uh, also taking some of the questions from, from, from Slido, um, in, in this reply, of course, we would very much support integrated uh, management commitments. In, if they are described as such, um, and and of, if they really tackle the issues of the biodiversity strategy of 2030, which will be part of, of, of the assessment, if they are already mentioned in the paths, so the better the, the different sides of the, of the coin and the different uh, stakeholders and, and elements and at the table, um, will really uh, communicate these need of such integrated approaches and, and of course I fully understand them, the better, the higher the chance that they also get implemented. But it's true of course in, in situations where money is, is uh, not endless, uh, mem member states 
tend to go for very targeted, very specific measures. And to find the right balance between those is, is indeed a challenge. Uh, so we would encourage and uh, we would uh, also, well, have uh, if what I say, if they are well described uh, to, to, to contribute to the PAF's objectives, uh, they are more than welcome. Thank you, very, thank you very much, um, Antonia. I, Jürgen, I hope um, you received the reply uh, to your question. Um, now I would like to invite our second um, uh, panelist, Michaela uh, Kunz from ba Bavarian State Ministry of the Environment, who will tell us a bit what uh, the Action Group on Connectivity, the EU SALP uh, called, and they, um, and what is their experience, and uh, also to give uh, her the possibility to ask a question. Michaela, the floor is yours. Yes, thank you very much. Um, good morning to all of you and thanks for the invitation um, and the opportunity to briefly pitch what's going on on macro regional level in the Alpine region where we are coordinating together with Slovenia an action group which is dealing with uh, green infrastructure in the Alpine region and this is an action group of Alpine states and regions but also involves NGOs, scientific partners and um, related projects. So we follow a transnational approach and also a rather strategic one for the Alpine region. And so since five years we are working and could in, in a first step launch a political declaration of Alpine states and regions. And since then we are happy that we could mobilize funding for different implementation projects under different programs and mainly um, we could uh, build on the interreg um, programs cross-border but also transnational um, for and let's say mainly covering aspects like communication analysis coordination capacity building all these things and what we are now in our let's say second implementation phase would go um, more in that direction of concrete implementation on the ground. So we are wondering how could we um, uh, enlarge our toolbox, our good mixture of funding opportunities towards this direction. And we are on the one hand thinking about the mainstream ERDF, but also of course of, we are thinking about life and um, specifically for one topic where we are at the moment thanks to European Parliament budget developing an Alpine peatland roadmap together with local stakeholders. So what should be done in Alpine peatland protection also with regard to climate change. And um, that would also lead us to our question or what we are considering is um, would life be, uh, for example, a SNAP, an appropriate funding opportunity under such a transnational approach and if we talk about a joint approach from Slovenia to France or would you rather recommend us something else and uh, we are looking for any feedback and looking also forward to stay in touch with all of you. Thanks a lot. Thank you very much uh, Michaela. Um, Silvia, I believe this question is um, uh, addressed to you so if you can uh, yes, I think it's about the, the SNAP mostly. Um, and uh, I mean, in principle, uh, I think it could be possible uh, to finance these type of uh, ideas. Uh, nonetheless, as I said earlier, um, a lot of the, the documents that will um, frame the future are still under finalization. So at this stage, we cannot confirm exactly um, what, what will be the best tool, which type of instrument will be best suited for, uh, for this? Uh, what would be an advice to you and to everyone else who's interested in developing uh, uh, ASNAP? Uh, it's uh, to wait for the call to be out. Uh, there will be in the call also an indication of, uh, let's call it a, an uh, IP help desk. I think this uh, existed already where you can submit your uh, ideas and get uh, an advice of whether it would fit or not. So that would be probably the best for everyone who's interested in a snap to still be patient for a while and wait for this information to come out and to liaise and get in touch with us. 
And Silvia, if you allow me, in the interest of time, I've noticed that in Slido there were a couple of other questions about SNAP, so maybe I will just try to quickly respond to them so that we have more time to for the other speakers as well and for other questions. Uh, one question was about, uh, let's say, the funding and the, the year marking of budget uh, uh, for the SNAP versus uh, traditional projects. And the answer, again, uh, uh, is that at the moment we don't have um, yet final figures, so we don't have uh, things finalized. Uh, but I would not be worried also because uh, uh, in terms uh, of the overall budget, this has increased. So I, I assumed and hope there will be opportunities for all type of instruments to be adequately funded. So if the question was about a fear of decreasing the budget for traditional, I think uh, this will not be uh, a main problem. Uh, and when it comes to NGOs um, having the possibility to lead a SNAP, normally this tool is uh, uh, conceived as a tool for authorities and those that are responsible for the PATH implementation. We never had a case uh, where uh, an NGO um, was delegated uh, uh, this, this role. Uh, so, uh, in principle, uh, I would say that uh, the, the responsibility to lead such type of, uh, of projects uh, remains in the hands of the authorities that are responsible for the PATH uh, implementation. And I think with these were the questions on SNAPs that I uh, spotted. Yeah, thank you very much, um, Silvia. And uh, I suggest that we move now to Slido, thank you very much for, for, for this uh, grouping, um, uh, the questions and the reply. I suggest we move to Slido now. And then uh, I will start taking the questions um, uh, from there. So uh, there is a question um, for DG Agri uh, from uh, Jan Sliva. Um, uh, to DG Agri, how efficiently the top part of 32 uh, uh, to be or the direct payments um, uh, as a result of the implementation of the bird and habitats uh, directive, water payment directive is used to foster habitat uh, species of connectivity. Uh, Antonia, would you? <laughs> yes. <laughs> Thank you very much, Jan, for this uh, very specific question. Indeed, uh, just to, to explain what it is about, it is about that uh, areas which have been uh, agricultural areas before 2008 and then became areas under the Habitats and the Birds Directive and the Water Framework Directive are still eligible for direct payments. To what extent these direct payments then have been used for for uh, increasing the the connectivity and the biodiversity aspects in general is of course uh, difficult to say because the the direct payments as such are not a management commitment, but they enable and they are important. Uh, for many farmers, in particular in areas which are not intensively used, to continue farming. And you know very well that, well, certain types of agriculture are very important for this connectivity. So it very much depends on what type of agriculture is, is practiced there. But this agriculture in the Natura 2000 areas is, of course, restricted according to the legal uh, conditions. So hence, we can say that direct payments at least uh, helped that agricultural uh, activities continue in that and, and continue, hopefully, under the restrictions of Natura 2000, etc., to serve also the connectivity. But they are not a targeted tools. The, so the targeted tools to improve connectivity, etc., that that would be all the other measures uh, which we have in the current uh, pillar two and which we will have in the future. Thank you. Thank you, um, Antonia. There is another question um, uh, to you, uh, which is uh, how you will ensure that these uh, funds, so the CIP um, um, funding possibilities uh, are um, uh, for biodiversity are released, whether uh, there will be um, possibility for other stakeholders than farmers to apply for, for these funds. Yeah, thank you very much, uh, Marie -Jose for the, for Maria Jose, sorry, for this question. Um, indeed, 
Well, um, I think there was a little error in the presentation which we had earlier. So it's uh, true that for, for parts of the payments that are in future more targeted to environment and climate, parts of those are really for the farmer specifically. But the classical agri-environmental uh, management commitments are what we know now under agri-environmental and climate measures in the current period. They are also um, uh, accessible for farmers and other beneficiaries. So they, they are not bound to the fact of uh, being an active farmer or to receive direct payments. So other management, uh, other uh, land managers can well receive those payments under the pillar two. That is different for pillar one. Um, they have to be released uh, in in a way, of course. I mean, uh, and that maybe also includes some some of the comments that uh, how, whether we make sure that the the ring fencing and the percentage are achieved. These uh, percentages, as I said, the thirty percent for the second pillar for environment and climate, they have to be fulfilled. Uh, otherwise, uh, the the rest of the money would be blocked, and and member states would lose uh, money. So, of course member states are well, um, they have a big interest of, of spending these money for, for the purpose of environment and climate. And just to add a little thing, under the first pillar, so the what we call the eco scheme, so enhanced uh, environmental commitments also in, 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 in combination with direct payments. Also there in the current negotiations with the Parliament and with the Council, a certain ring fencing is in the discussion. We hadn't proposed that. We will see how that will, will come up, but that may also then, of course, uh, um, reserve a certain amount of the money for these eco schemes, uh, which, and, and to, to finalize that, which have to be uh, proposed by the member states. But of course, as the agri-environmental measures uh, of the current period and of the future, all these are voluntary uh, voluntary commitments that farmers uh, do so. If the farmers have no interest also in, in, in participating in a life project, then it's very difficult. But of course, member states are asked to design their measures accordingly so that farmers are interested to participate. Thank you very much, um, Antonia. Now we go back to live. Federico uh, Minozzi is asking a question, how um, to ease the access uh, to life funds to small entities, whether there is uh, something uh, um, like that is previewed. So small entities being municipalities, protected areas managers, not over 2000 uh, management uh, bodies. Lots of nature is managed by small bodies with limited capacities and uh, resources. Um, so, Sylvia, could you please uh, take up this question? Yes, this, uh, I mean, what, uh, uh, what is written here, uh, it's, it's correct and it's true. And uh, also the small bodies, small NGOs, uh, small municipalities have uh, a key role to play in the management of uh, Natura 2000 and biodiversity in general. Uh, actually, it would be interesting to exchange more about it because we do have examples already in uh, the ongoing projects of uh, like small municipalities uh, uh, coordinating even uh, projects. Um, and it, although it's true that for them there are more uh, challenges uh, than a bigger organization, uh, this is uh, still possible. Something that I've noticed, for instance, with uh, some of the projects uh, I followed is that often they also come together, small municipalities uh, participating uh, together in a, in a bigger um, consortium, let's say. And this maybe can help uh, also reinforcing uh, over the territory, uh, the presence. So uh, actually this question, maybe I don't have uh, uh, an answer, it would be good to know what, what difficulties uh, specifically, um, and if we can help, I think uh, there can be always uh, means to, to do so. But also to look maybe at the experience of already ongoing projects, try to liaise with them, uh, checking on the, also our, um, life database, the, the, the ongoing projects that maybe are in the same region uh, as of interest and uh, check with the with those who are already ongoing what, what has been their experience. This can also help. 
Yeah, thank you very much, um, Silvia. And uh, indeed, if you would like to provide with more um, elements about your question or from what you have seen as experience and, and why you believe that there is some obstacles or something doesn't work, don't hesitate to send the questions. Each fund and each funding instrument and each director general has a functional mailbox to which all citizens can send um, questions. The, the commission also has a functional mailbox. And then um, someone uh, will uh, come to you to a um, particular reply. So now uh, we are going uh, back to uh, we are going to Nerea actually with the next uh, question, um, which uh, um, 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 so someone from the audience is asking how can basic data knowledge um, acquisitions or data species population sizes statuses evaluation fish mortality from um, hydropower uh, turbines etc be funded okay. so Maria, i think you are the so best i understand that okay so i understand that this is referring to more in situ data collections so first i would like to friends explain that uh, still we are struggling a little bit to set up a eu framework monitoring on biodiversity and ecosystem services and Nerea, you have been muted ah sorry <laughs> uh, well i don't know what i you missed so Start i said the beginning that, okay apologies so i will say that uh, uh, this is referred to i presume in situ data collection so I would like to, to say three things. First, that we are working now a new project that is called Europa Bond that I have put in the chat is trying to develop a EU framework for monitoring and biodiversity and ecosystem services to first to understand which is the data that, that we need to have, how to urbanize, and they are uh, engaging the stakeholder community to understand which is the data, to develop new tech, to understand a cost-effective method to do so, uh, uh, so this is one part. So if you are interested in this, please engage with this project that is developing a network. So this will be important. Uh, the second one, the EU Biodiversity Partnership, as I mentioned, will bring 114 million for, to help the implementation of this data collection. At the end, we know that part of the data collection has to be made by the member state, is the responsibility, but with the partnership, we, we hope this that's the idea to help on that so put an eye on the biodiversity partnership also um so this is a, another thing um we are developing what is so it's i think uh, also we have other environmental observation we have copernicus and we have a we are increasing a lot the capabilities of earth observation to monitoring things um, including also tools that could help. To, also, another thing is the citizen science. Uh, we are pushing for the citizens to engage on this in situ monitoring. We have some good examples in rivers with the Amber project uh, that is already monitoring the barriers on rivers. So there are possibilities in there. We need to be more innovative in the way that we do so, but we put a part of us, but also the member state need to engage also in, in this. I hope this helped a little bit. Yeah, thank you very much, uh, uh, Nerea. Um, I just would like to remind the audience and those that are um, uh, following us through the Zoom, please post your questions in Slido, not in the chat, because this will be much easier for us um, to follow. Um, so uh, now uh, there is a question uh, to Maud, uh, which I will join with another question, which is uh, similar to this. So are there any opportunities for funding new NGOs and small business supporting the EU Green Deal? And then there is another question also related to the NGOs. So I will just uh, ask you to reply, invite you to reply to, to two of them, which is uh, whether there are any funding opportunities for NGOs with less than two years of uh, activity. Uh, Maud? Yeah, thank you. So as I mentioned earlier, it's really, I mean, the support is tailored uh, to the needs and potential of the member states and, and regions and the different areas. So what is uh, supported specifically, let's say, it's really program specific. So, so that there is always a need to check a bit uh, in your, let's say, location, what what is what can be supported from from this funding, uh, etc. But that being said, of course, I, I would expect uh, to see uh, 
support for, for small businesses, uh, growth, competitiveness and job creation in small businesses, uh, an important priority in, probably in many programs and, and of course the European Green Deal uh, objectives are a general priority, so I would expect uh, such opportunities for funding uh, to, to appear in, in many programs, uh, both uh, the national and regional, let's say, mainstream ERDF programs and, and probably also in, in, in a number of interreg uh, programs. Uh, concerning NGOs and, and also if they are uh, new or relatively new, what, what uh, what might be relevant? I mean, again, it's program specific, but what there is uh, to be mentioned here, maybe there, there is uh, enhanced focus on uh, capacity building and there is a new possibility uh, uh, to have improved capacity of sectorial and territorial actors responsible for carrying out uh, different types of activities related to the implementation of the funding. Uh, when it contributes to the objectives of the program. So if you if a program is working, for example, on this specific objective related to, to biodiversity and nature, which I presented earlier, there, there, there is also possibilities for uh, related support, let's say for capacity building for, for different types of actors uh, important for the realization of those priorities. So there could uh, potentially be some opportunities for, for uh, and you support uh, in that context, for example, but again, to be seen in the specific uh, programs. Thank you. Okay, um, thank you very much. I think, um, so the next question is not targeted to anyone, um, which is about uh, clean energy transition. So is there coordinated work in the European Commission between grey infrastructure, like for example, the energy corridors and green ones? Um, uh, I don't know to whom exactly this question is targeted to. Uh, Maud, would you like to say something? Otherwise, I might provide a bit, according to my knowledge, um, a bit of an answer, especially for, for energy corridors. Uh, um, on my side, maybe maybe to refer again to the, the transnational cooperation and the macro-regional strategies, which might look at this, but, but you, you may have a more a broader reply. Thank you. Um, it's, a, it's a bit about the uh, uh, coordination, actually, especially for the energy corridors, you know, that the new 10E is um, uh, with all these new energy corridors and so on and so on, uh, where it was all uh, developed and followed by uh, the colleagues from DG Energy, which are not um, with us um, today. But uh, in terms of how these new corridors are um, um, kind of overlapping and what their interaction with the Natura 2000, especially Natura 2000 network um, is uh, going to be. There is a work that was, uh, has been um, carried out. We coordinated a lot uh, um, uh, this uh, work between the two uh, director generals, uh, director general for the environment and director general for energy. Um, and uh, we developed uh, especially um, uh, guidance, uh, which is about energy transmission facilities and Natura 2000 and the requirements that are coming from the Birds and Habitats Directive for new developments, in which we also looked at um, about the refurbishment, refurbishment and renewal of the new, um, I mean, existing installations and development of a new installation. This guidance, uh, whoever asked the question, uh, this guidance is available on the uh, Nature and Biodiversity website on the DG Environment, the European Commission. So um, I would like to invite you to, to, to have a look and you might find um, answers. I don't know whether this replied the question uh, fully, but at least this gives a bit of a hint uh, that uh, yes, indeed, there is a coordination. Um, so then uh, there is a question, we have uh, three more minutes, so I will try to get as many questions as possible. Um, Nerea, so I don't... how do you define transform transformative change and how do you measure it? Oh, this is an impossible question, let's say. I will keep the answer that I, that I from one of the IPES uh, members, the Inter Intergovernmental Panel on Biodiversity and Ecosystem Services, that is do the things in a different way that we are doing right now. I just put before in the link, we have in RTD, we organize a workshop uh, with scientists that are working, developing the post-2020 biodiversity framework. Uh, and we have developed some material because we have we, we, we were working in different sector for different policies, what that means. 
we didn't brought uh, a clear ideas, but we are going to finance a research on this specific topic. What that means transformative change and how can we how can we embed it in our daily and policy making? Sorry, I don't have a brilliant answer for that. Uh, okay, so the next question is uh, from Mold. Um, from uh, Federico Minozzi, uh, how to balance the willingness to promote innovation versus the need to support existing good practices? Will Interreg fund, uh, practical, fund practical conservation measures? Uh, thank you. So maybe I start with the second question. So, so as you saw in the presentation, the Interreg funds are relatively, let's say, limited, relatively smaller. So uh, there is not always a scope for, let's say, large uh, investment, uh, but but we the programs uh, can and do fund also also I mean investment uh, uh, and uh, can fund uh, also uh, conservation measures as I mentioned. So again, it will depend on the analysis uh, of that particular program area. And it's a bit uh, on, on the balance versus innovation and, and uh, what is deployment, let's say, of existing good uh, solution. It's again to be seen, uh, we, are, we are promoting both, I mean, for the ERDF in, in general and for Interreg. Uh, there is also this policy objective one, which is really focusing on, on innovation. Uh, so again, it's to be seen, I think, uh, uh, in the analysis area by area, where to, how to find the right uh, balance, let's say, for the use of the funding uh, also in this particular area. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much, um, uh, Maud, for this um, reply. Uh, so I see, um, so the next question, uh, so I see a next question to Antonia. Will it be possible to use CAP funding for pilot RBPS implemented through a live SNAPS, for example? Yeah, thank you very much for this uh, very practical question. And of course, uh, in theory, so we, from our side, it would be possible. Uh, now, again, it, as I said, it depends. Uh, on the member states to include these aspects in their CAP plans. So again, here I would very much encourage the, the stakeholders involved to, to, to request that from the uh, agricultural ministry and from the environmental ministry to, because water and in particular, I think this question is coming from Spain again. So uh, in, in particular in Spain, uh, water issues are really important in the CAP plan. And let me just say, to in this uh, context also that uh, which I what I haven't mentioned but the link is in the presentation and will be distributed that the commission has on December issued recommendations to every member state uh, regarding the future cap plans and the green deals and uh, uh, the biodiversity and the the paths have played a major role in these recommendations. So I highly invite you, uh, it's the third link in the presentation, uh, to look at the recommendations we have given to the specific member state. Thanks. Okay, um, thank you very much. Um, I think uh, with this, uh, we can close this uh, first panel where we explored the various possibilities given by four uh, EU funds, uh, public funds. Uh, I would like to thank very much to our great speakers, uh, to, so to Silvia, to Nerea, Antonia and Maud. I would like to, take, uh, to thank a lot also to Jürgen and Michaela, uh, also um, providing their, uh, presenting us uh, their pitches. I would like to thank to all the audience and for all the questions. And uh, uh, now uh, we have time for a short coffee break. So use the time efficiently, go grab a coffee, take a chocolate, whatever you need to raise your energy levels, because then we have another panel with a lot of interesting um, presentations about innovative um, financing uh, that, um, has, uh, that uh, has been um, used uh, uh, for financing uh, connectivity uh, corridors. So um, I will wait for all of you uh, here back at 11.50. So enjoy your coffee.